Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for coming in uh, today, this afternoon, for this afternoon's talk. My name is Tupten Wangdu, and I'm very happy to welcome all of you this afternoon here at Tushita on this very special occasion, this very special day of Sakadava, where we yeah, today being one of the most important, if not the most important, Buddhist holiday of the year, where we remember and celebrate the Buddha's birth, the Buddha's enlightenment, as well as also the Buddha's Paranirvana, meaning the Buddha's passing on after having lived such an extraordinary life of perfecting his spiritual realizations and teaching them effectively to others. So we remember this today, and for that reason, we gather together here this afternoon to have a small Dharma chat together, talking a little bit about the Buddha's teachings, his views on reality, and especially focusing on this afternoon what the Buddha taught about or with respect to our human potential, the potential that we have as human beings, how we as human beings have incredible potential to develop ourselves and how our minds have an amazing capacity. Yeah, the title of this talk is The Limitless Potential of Our Minds. And this is what the Buddha talked about, that the potential of our mind is limitless. And how when we learn how to tap into that potential, even just a little bit, over time we will be able to develop a state of what we call full enlightenment, or what I like to call perfect, lasting mental health, we could say, right? That's what enlightenment actually refers to. It's a state of lasting, non-changing, perfect inner fulfillment and mental health. This is what our potential is. This is what the Buddha talked about. You know, usually, I think it's fairly common that when we think about Buddhism, when people hear about Buddhism, what the Buddha taught, the first thing that often comes to our minds, you know, what we usually associate with Buddhism initially, is that the Buddha said, everything is suffering. No? Life is suffering, and you have to accept that and you better learn how to deal with it, because that's how it is. I think this is a very common misconception that many people have. It's a very common misunderstanding. People thinking, oh yeah, Buddhists, those guys. <laughs> all they talk about is suffering and death all the time. Must be really depressed, these Buddhists. Must be quite a drag to be a Buddhist, because they believe everything is suffering. You know, the thing is, the Buddha actually, he never actually said that. The Buddha never said that life is suffering. When the Buddha talked about what is called the first noble truth, yeah, which is called the truth of suffering, he never meant, when he talked about this, that life is suffering. But what he said was that for somebody who continuously acts and reacts under the influence of their disturbing emotions and never looks inside to work with one's mind in order to change something about this, for that person, suffering experiences are unavoidable. For someone who doesn't know how their own minds function, how they work. And for somebody who keeps following their desires, attachment and anger based on not seeing reality clearly, for that person, the experience of dissatisfaction is inevitable. Suffering will come if we have a mistaken view and follow it. So 
the Buddha's discovery was not merely that we suffer, that we experience dissatisfaction in life, that we have mental problems, physical problems, inner and outer hardships and difficulties. I mean, to some degree, we all discover that for ourselves every day, on a daily basis, don't we? Our lives being influenced by problems, by hardship. The Buddha saw that too. But he didn't just leave it there, you see. His great discovery then was that we can bring an end to suffering. That suffering, dissatisfaction can be brought to a final stop and that we all have the potential to bring this about within us. The Buddha saw very clearly that as human beings we have the potential to free ourselves completely from any form of emotional suffering. That in fact, freedom from suffering, a state of perfect inner peace, is our actual nature, what we actually are. So what the Buddha actually talked about was happiness, true happiness, lasting joy, inner fulfillment, bliss, the potential of which lies within us right now, every moment. It is the essential nature of our minds. He taught that all living beings have within them what is called Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha in Sanskrit, the essence of or potential for full enlightenment which is the fundamental nature of all conscious beings, all sentient beings. This inner clarity, this fundamental purity of our minds is with us right now. It is right here, wherever we go, whatever we do, whomever we engage with, we have it. But sadly, we usually fail to recognize that this is the case. We fail to see that we have it, and therefore, most often, we neglect that. We neglect it. Because this inner purity of ours, this inner pure nature of ours, is temporarily obscured by our own confusion and disturbing emotions. It's like a treasure of diamond and gold, you know, diamonds and gold that is buried deep within us and we can't really see it. It's kind of hidden below layers upon layers of various harmful habitual tendencies that we have accumulated over a very long time. Habitual tendencies that have been created by our disturbing emotions, such as attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, low self-esteem, fear, anxiety, you name them, we know them well. They have been created by our disturbing emotions and then we have been constantly reinforcing them by us acting on these negative habitual tendencies again and again and again. So we have habituated our minds with disturbing emotions for a very long time. And they now influence whatever we experience. So the purpose of Buddhist practice now, the aim of the Buddhist path, is to dig out that inner treasure of clarity that we have within us. You know, to kind of by way of removing the various obscurations that obscure this inner treasure our own disturbing emotions, our delusions, our mistaken views, and the harmful habits we have created due to them. To remove them skillfully in order to reveal our true nature of inner clarity. To make that manifest, so to say. It's a bit like cleaning the dirt away from a mirror in order to fully reveal its clarity, so that the mirror can reflect its surroundings perfectly, clearly, correctly. So our minds, they are indeed a bit like a mirror. 
just like a mirror by its very nature reflects visual objects, you know, a mirror naturally giving a clear representation of what is surrounding it due to its innate characteristic of having clarity, you know, a mirror reflecting things, also our minds are reflecting things all the time and by nature our minds possess the characteristic of clarity. But if a mirror is obscured, if a mirror is dirty, then phenomena cannot be reflected in it accurately, right? The mirror will give an unclear, faulty representation of what surrounds it. It does not show things clearly because it's dirty, you know, it's obscured, and therefore the mirror cannot fulfill its potential. But we have to say that the dirt on the mirror is not in the nature of the mirror. It can be taken away, right? It can be removed. If we know the right method, how to clean a mirror, then we can remove the dirt from its surface and its natural clarity will be revealed. Okay. If I clean a mirror though, it is not that I create its clarity. The clarity is already there. The clarity of the mirror is present all along, all the time, always. It's just temporarily obscured. But when we clean it, you know, when I clean the mirror, I just take away what hinders the clarity of the mirror to manifest, so to say. By way of applying the right method, you know, namely cleaning it with a... a pff, pff, you know, how do you call that? What's a, a, a spray. It's not called a pff, pff, is it? No. Okay. If I move, take a spray, a, a mirror cleaner and a cloth, then I'm able to remove the dirt from a mirror. That is the unmistaken method of how to clean dirt from a mirror, isn't it? In order to slowly, step by step, reveal its clarity. It is the universally agreed upon technique of how to clean a mirror, or a window, or any other surface in our kitchen, homes, bathrooms. No? Now, in the same way, our minds are like a mirror. The mind is also in its nature clarity. It is by its very nature pure, we say in Buddhism. In Buddhism we define the mind as that which is clear and knowing. That is the Buddhist definition of mind. That which, which is clear and knowing or that which is clarity, luminosity by its nature, and has as its function to be aware, to perceive, to experience. Okay. But at the moment, the mirror of our mind is obscured by our own disturbing emotions and the harmful habits we have accumulated through them. What is a disturbing emotion? There is various ways of how to translate the Sanskrit word klesha, which is sometimes translated as delusion, mental afflictions, disturbing attitudes, harmful thoughts, disturbing emotions. There's various ways of how to, to translate the Sanskrit word klesha, but all of these translations refer to factors in our minds that cause our minds to be agitated, unpeaceful, that disturb the mind, harmful thoughts, tendencies, and so forth. So therefore, due to being obscured by disturbing emotions, the mirror of our mind at the moment does not reflect things accurately. We are deluded, confused with respect to how things actually are, and therefore we react to the world based on exaggeration and mistaken views, which brings as its consequence the experience of suffering. But this is not our actual nature. 
confusion and disturbing emotions are not the main character of our minds. The various disturbing emotions, such as attachment, anger, ignorance, pride, jealousy, guilt, arrogance, fear, anxiety, and so forth, we have them at the moment, to some degree or the other, but they are not who we are. They are just old habits, basically, that we have trusted and followed for too long, and therefore they became deeply ingrained to a degree that we start to identify with them. But they are not you. These disturbing emotions can be taken away. They can be healed, just like dirt can be removed and taken away from a mirror. Behind that, behind disturbing, these disturbing emotions, there is a fundamental beauty and clarity, which is your actual nature. We just need the right and cloth to reveal it, you see. Paired with the recognition, the strong conviction, the realization that there is indeed a clarity behind our confusion that is indestructible. That has always been there, that is here right now, and that always will be here. We just don't recognize it at the moment, because we identify with the wrong thing. At the moment we perceive everything, the outer world, things, people, as well as ourselves, who we think we are, and our inner world, we perceive it all influenced by confusion and disturbing emotions, and therefore we see things unclearly. I mean, we know that whatever goes on outside of ourselves, in our daily life, whatever happens out there, how our mind perceives things, how our, the mind reflects our reality, it does that according to the state that the mind is in. No? We know that if we are quite angry, if we feel distressed, if we are anxious, obviously things will appear difficult to us. Everything is kind of tough, it seems hard to handle, and it appears to us in that light. It appears rough. No? Our job, the various activities that we usually actually like, that we usually enjoy, or where we live, our homes, our things, our gardens, or who we live with, our partners, our families, our friends, other people. When we feel angry and distressed, everything is interpreted by an angry and distressed mind as difficult, rough and hard. And it appears to us as totally difficult, rough and unenjoyable, doesn't it? But then, maybe on the next day, the situation might be exactly the same. The same job, the same place, the same partner. Out there it's all the same, but the mind is maybe somehow a bit more kind, we feel a bit more relaxed the next day, we are a bit more happy, and things are interpreted totally differently by that kind of mind. Things appear differently to us, and it's not that bad in the end. You know? So we need to be careful not to immediately believe how things appear to us, always, as existing in exactly that way, being exactly like that from their own side, because it completely depends on the state of our minds, what state of our, the mind is in at that moment, even just on that day, how things will appear to us. How things appear to you, it comes from your own mind. How you experience your reality, your day, comes from how your mind interprets reality on that day your own perspective, basically, what you bring to the world, not so much what comes from the world to you. If the mirror of the mind is dirty, it will give a dirty reflection, unclear. If the mirror of the mind is clean, clear, the reflection it gives is clean, clear, because we see things clearly. Yeah. And that 
according to the Buddha's view, according to the view of the Buddha, it is that where happiness actually comes from. Where genuine well-being actually derives from, it derives from clearly seeing how things are. It does not derive from external objects as such, but it comes from a peaceful, kind, and clearly understanding mind. When we see things clearly, how things are, our minds reflecting things accurately, meaning understanding what reality really is, how we ourselves as a human being exist, how our minds function, when we understand how things around us exist, how the world and its phenomena function and work together, what their actual nature is. When we understand and see this clearly, then we can begin to live our lives in accordance with that clear seeing, putting our actions of body, speech and mind in accordance with clear understanding. And according to Buddhism, it is that which forms the basis for the experience of satisfaction and happiness for us. Understanding the nature of reality and then living in harmony with that understanding. Seeing things clearly and then living in accordance with that clear seeing. Because we all want to be happy, don't we? We all want happiness. We can really say that this is a main purpose in our lives and a main purpose of the lives of all beings is that we want to experience happiness, a happy mind, satisfaction, well-being, safety, health, togetherness, love. Although some people might feel they don't have a purpose in life, one purpose they certainly have, they want to be happy. They want to be free from suffering. This wish for happiness, this very basic aspiration, this very intuitive yearning that we have within us, basically all the time, to a subtle degree, it's kind of always there behind every action that we do, wanting to feel good, to be well, and to have the conditions necessary for that, this is something we all share with all sentient beings. With respect to that, we are all equal. In fact, that we even have this aspiration from the Buddhist perspective is a most rudimentary, a most fundamental sign that we also have the potential to bring this to fruition, to achieve that. But how? How do we achieve that? How do we cultivate a state of lasting true happiness within us? We have to clean the mirror of our minds from what causes us to suffer. Just as we all share the wish for happiness and well-being, the aspiration for genuine satisfaction, we are also all in the same boat of at the moment being subject to many harmful thoughts and disturbing emotions. Again, this is our situation at the moment, isn't it? I mean, we all have that. You are not alone. We all are in the same boat in that. And from the Buddhist perspective, it is these harmful thoughts and disturbing emotions in our own minds which are the cause for our suffering which are the main cause for our dissatisfaction, which stand in the way of our experience of genuine happiness. In Buddhism, we clearly identify the main source of suffering does actually not lie outside of ourselves, but it lies within our own minds. It is based on not seeing things clearly, that our minds engage with the world in distorted ways. It is that which becomes the main cause of suffering. And in Buddhism, the main dirt on our mirror that obscures the mirror of our minds is what we call ignorance. As I just keep talking, it is confusion of not seeing things clearly. It refers to an active 
not knowing, being subject to an active misapprehension, misunderstanding of the nature of reality, how things exist. We have a mind that is confused with respect to how things are. And ignorance here in Buddhism refers specifically to our innate grasping at an inherent I and mine. It is due to this mental factor of ignorance that grasps at inherent existence that we perceive ourselves as independent, self-existent selves and we perceive others as independent, self-existent others out there, separate from me. We have the very strong appearance no, that things, people, places, right now, have independent self-nature apart from me. And we grasp at that appearance to be completely true, whereas in fact nothing whatsoever exists in an independent manner. No person, no thing, no place has independent self-existence. In reality, we are all totally interconnected with the world and its beings, completely. But since we do not recognize that, since we don't recognize our actual codependence with each other, but on the contrary, we intuitively grasp at independence, me here, you there, there's all these people in the world, some are my friends and they like me and they are cool, but some of them are really annoying and I don't like them, they're really not cool. I don't want to even look at them. And there's all these other people that I don't know and they are strangers and they are all a bit weird. Better to take care, not to get too close to them. This is how we kind of have our, that's our default mode of how we apprehend other people, our surroundings and so forth. We don't, you know, we keep holding on to intuitive mistaken ideas about how things are. Our minds are mistaken with respect to the interdependent nature of reality. There's many things to be said about this. But anyway, it's due to that then, that our minds, because of this, start to exaggerate, to hallucinate, basically, based on that mistaken view. We start to project all kinds of qualities onto phenomena and people and the world, which they, from their own side, do not actually possess, do not actually have. And the first way of how that happens, the first way of how our minds exaggerate things, is called attachment. Attachment being this ego-driven craving for pleasant experiences that we have. And its main characteristic is that attachment exaggerates, blows out of proportion, the attractive aspects of a particular object, person, thing or situation, and then latches onto it and longs to possess it, to have it, seeing that thing, that person, that situation, that activity as the very source for my happiness. And then doesn't want to let go of it. So we can say that attachment apprehends pleasantness in an exaggerated, unrealistic way. And then, if our attachments are not fulfilled, if our attachments do not get what they expect, what they want, the next exaggeration that then happens due to this is called anger. Anger is this ego-driven aversion to unpleasant things. When things don't go the way I want them to go, its main characteristic being that it exaggerates the unattractive aspects of a particular thing, person or situation and then wishes to have it out of my life, wishes to harm it. Seeing that person, that thing or situation as the inherent source for my unhappiness. So we can say anger apprehends unpleasantness, unpleasant aspects in a mistaken, exaggerated way, due to ignorance, 
these two arise. And then, first of all, these three here, ignorance, attachment and anger, are what we call in Buddhist psychology the three poisons. The three main mental factors that poison our mind stream, that bring suffering. They are the three root disturbing emotions from which then all other disturbing mind states that we experience in our life grow, arise from that further cause us to see things unclearly and they cloud our true nature. So, in order to be able to overcome these disturbing mind states that cause us to suffer, we need to familiarize our minds with the correct inner positive counterforces. We need to de develop the right antidotes, we say that are able to overcome these so-called mental poisons, which cloud the mirror-like nature of our minds. We have to develop healing mind states which can acknowledge and heal these harmful mind states. It is a process that happens from within. It doesn't really help to distract ourselves with outer pleasures all the time because we don't want to look at this. That's what we usually do. We're constantly looking outside for a particular situation that feels pleasant in order to overshadow, not to distract us from this situation, because we have so much fear and uncertainty to face what is in here that we never do it, because it's hard work, it's tough. But it's extremely important and the only worthwhile thing to really bring about change in our lives for the better is that we have to start to look inside and clean up our inner landscape to begin to clean the mirror of our minds. And the process of familiarizing our minds with the right positive inner counter forces is what is called meditation. This is what meditation is. This is what meditation means. Habituating our minds with various positive mental states which will act as an antidote to our disturbing emotions and inner obscurations. We need to over time learn how to cultivate that within us. This is what meditation means. Meditation doesn't just mean sitting in the corner crossing our legs and hoping for the best. You know, being quiet and going into a trance-like state and thinking, whoa, I'm meditating. This is supposed to feel really good. It doesn't really feel like anything, but at least it looks good when others check. Wow, he's meditating. That's not what it's about. It's about cultivating actively within us, familiarizing the mind. That is what the Tibetan word gom, that we usually translate as meditation, has as its main connotation. It means to familiarize to habituate, to get to know our own minds and the positive aspects that we have within us, such as kindness, joy, love, compassion, wisdom, generosity, humility, serenity. We have these states, but they are often buried below these kind of red troublemakers. So we need the of wisdom the clarity, cleaner of wisdom, together with the cloth of compassion, these two, which, when cultivated correctly, systematically practiced well by way of listening, contemplating, and finally meditating, they will over time be able to remove the various levels of obscura obscurations, and we will eventually achieve the fulfillment of our own inner potential, a state of Buddhahood, lasting mental health. This is a possibility. This is what we can all do. It just depends on learning the correct methods of how to bring this about, and then, over time, familiarizing ourselves with them more and more, and practicing them, and developing the new habit of 
looking within and cultivating these inner states that overcome the harmful habits that we identify with usually. You see that a bit? That is the idea. That is what the Buddhist path is all about. Okay. Because the potential for that inner lasting mental health is, as I try to express to you, already here, right now. It just needs to be taken care of. It needs to be nourished. It needs to be revealed. So here I would like to mention or to add on to that, that this analogy of the dirty mirror that we have used up until now to describe our inner potential for enlightenment, which is called our Buddha nature, this describes our Buddha nature, this analogy, from the perspective that the enlightened mind is already within you right now. That there is already Buddhahood within you, abiding within you, it is simply obscured. And we just need to remove the various obscurations to reveal what is already there. This is one perspective, one approach on how to, on how Buddha nature Buddha potential is described or presented, especially in the Kagyu and Nyingma schools of Tibetan Buddhism. You know, it is as if there is a Buddha already existing within you that is temporarily obscured by layers upon layers of obscurations, just like a Buddha that is inside of an onion. You know, it's in there, inside of these various layers of smelly confusion that we have to one by one kind of remove and that takes time and it's like oh, cutting on your nose, it's a bit tough sometimes. Like, so we have to get through that, you know, to, 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 to hit that spot, what is already here, recognize what we already are. There is nothing to add, there is nothing to cultivate as such, but we have to remove what is extra and not needed and what causes us to suffer. That's one perspective of how this is described. Another perspective on how Buddha nature is described, which is how Buddha nature or Buddha potential is described within the Geluk school of Tibetan Buddhism that we here in Tushita are a part of, is in terms of not that enlightenment is already existing within you right now as such, but to understand that Buddha nature, Buddha potential, is like a seed within you that needs to be nourished so it can grow to its fruition over time. You know, it's like if you take, for example, an acorn, right? An acorn has the innate potential to become an oak tree, isn't it? By its very definition, an acorn will give rise to an oak tree. This is what an acorn is, what it is defined as. So we can say that an acorn has oak tree potential within it. An acorn has oak tree nature. And therefore, when we make some effort, when we put the right conditions together, when we put the right outer causes and conditions together, meaning we prepare the ground, fertile ground, and then we plant the acorn in the ground, and then we give it warmth, sunlight, we give it water, we give it some fertilizer here and there, we might protect it with a fence, you know, from harming, interfering forces, and we let the factor of time elapse. Then, over time, Without a doubt, when all these conditions come together, an oak tree will develop. It will grow from it. First there's an oak tree baby sprouty, and then it grows and grows and grows into this massive phenomenon, a beautiful oak tree. In the same way, when we, as practitioners, put the right conditions together for spiritual growth, which from the Buddhist perspective means living an ethical lifestyle, a life based on non-violence, a life based on non-harm, but instead putting our actions of body, speech and mind in accordance with the wish to benefit others, 
the mind of compassion and love based on wisdom. And then from that develop our concentration, stabilizing our minds, developing a mind that is calm, clear and focused. And from within that cultivating the wisdom that sees reality clearly, overcoming our ignorance, our confusion. If these conditions come together over time and we make some effort to keep them, keep a continuity of them with us, then definitely our inner Buddha nature seed will develop towards enlightenment. In Buddhism, the very conditions that we need to bring together are these three. They are what are called the three higher trainings, the actual path that leads to a true cessation, a true stopping of suffering. Most commonly we can talk about practicing the two wings of wisdom and compassion, as we just saw with the cleaner and the cloth. Okay? They can also be expressed in that way. There's various ways of how to think about that. So, anyway, both these perspectives that I just talked about, either the perspective of Buddhahood being within you, and it just needs to be revealed, or Buddhahood being like a potential that needs to be nourished and cultivated, both of these perspectives are valid. And both of them have advantages and disadvantages, <laughs> we usually say. Because adopting the perspective that Buddhahood is a potential within you, you know, that it is like a seed, like an acorn that needs conditions to grow, we could then feel like, you know, oh goodness, it's so much work. It's just too tough. It's too difficult. I cannot grow this oak tree of enlightenment within me. It's just too difficult. It's too hard. Maybe I, it's too hard to produce a clear mirror within me. You know, maybe I might give up. That's one disadvantage of that view. Adopting the other view that Buddhahood is already within you and you already have it, it's just obscured. The disadvantage with that is that you can fall into the extreme of thinking, well, I'm already enlightened. I am already a Buddha. I don't need ethics, concentration, wisdom. Who cares about these things? I am a Buddha. You, you just don't recognize it like that. You know? that's, the next, that's another extreme we can fall into. Both of these extremes need to be avoided. You know? If we practice these two perspectives, whatever relates to you, we could say, correctly, and have the correct approach, understanding them clearly, they can be extremely effective. We just need to be careful not to fall into either extreme, either too difficult or no need to work at all. It's already done. So now this is what the Buddha is trying to tell us and what I just wanted to try to briefly express to you a little bit. What the Buddha is trying to tell us is when he talked about what is called the Four Noble Truths that some of you might have heard about, when the Buddha, after his enlightenment in Bodh Gaya, started to turn the wheel of Dharma for the first time, meaning when for the first time he expressed what he has realized with respect to the nature of reality, when for the first time he expressed that to others, and he taught it to others, he talked about what is called the Four Noble Truths. That at the moment, yes, we experience various levels of suffering, of dukkha, of dissatisfaction unsatisfactory experience. But this is not something random or arbitrary. This suffering, it comes from a cause. It arises from a cause, namely our own disturbing emotions and the harmful actions that we engage in influenced by our disturbing emotions. When we start to take care of them, meaning identify them, acknowledge them for what they are and then start to slowly heal them and work with them skillfully, we can reach what is called a true cessation, a true stopping, a true end of any form of suffering. Because without a cause, the result of suffering cannot come about. If you take away the cause, the result will go away as well. And true cessation can be achieved, he said, by way of applying the right method, number four, the path, which is this, ethics concentration and wisdom, cleaning the mirror of our mind. But it takes time. It takes quite some time. 
and constant familiarization, as well as the courage to never give up. Because every step we take into that direction, even if it's just a tiny step, it's a tiny step closer to real inner well-being. The more we habituate ourselves to that, the happier you yourself will be and the people who have to live with you will also be. You see. So that's the Buddha's message to us. The Buddha's message, far from being all gloomy and pessimistic, you know, the suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, it's actually most incredible. It says you can do it. You can achieve perfect inner freedom. This is your very potential. You know? Freedom and bliss are your actual nature. It just needs to be revealed. And that is wonderful, I think. Anyway, this is basically all I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so very much for coming in for this uh, short chat. Maybe what we can do is uh, what is usually done here in this tradition. And whenever we um, spend some time together to talk about these ideas and developing positive energy in our own minds by thinking about these things, is to dedicate that positive potential, to give it the right direction. So let's just take one minute to dedicate the positive energy accumulated by having these discussions here and yeah, having created that positive potential. So we can simply think to do coming together here and the effort we have put in this session due to listening and contemplating on this material here. May whatever positive potential we have created through that, may all of this become a cause for ourselves within us to develop a kind and open heart based on the wisdom that sees things more clearly. May we be able to bring that kind and open heart into the world, that whomever we may meet, whatever situation we might encounter this late afternoon and for the coming days, may all of this be based on the mind of kindness and love, with the wish may sentient beings achieve their true inner potential of Buddhahood, lasting well-being. May this session become a cause for the inner fruition of the amazing potential of all sentient beings. May they realize the nature of their minds and in this way be able to live a life of love, compassion and non-violence. May this session become a cause for this.